You're listening to the voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spare. And the sexual exploitation of young girls has dominated the British media in recent weeks. Confidential papers seen by a newspaper revealed that police and social services knew about a child sexual exploitation ring in England a decade ago. The reports seen by the Times show that young teenage white girls in Rotherham in South Yorkshire were used, transported and sold for sex by a gang of men for more than 10 years without there ever being a prosecution. And in May, nine men who ran a child sexual exploitation ring in Rochdale were jailed at Liverpool Crown Court after being found guilty of offences including rape and conspiracy to engage in sexual activity with girls under the age of 16. I'm joined in the studio by Professor of Law at City University, Jennifer Tempkin, who's a criminal lawyer. Nushra Mansouri is England Professional Officer at the British Association of Social Workers. And taking part in the discussion on the telephone is John Brown, Head of Sexual Abuse Programmes at Children's Charity, the NSPCC. Now, a new campaign is underway by the End Violence Against Women Coalition. Sarah Green from the Coalition couldn't be here. But well, I spoke to her earlier. A child can be very, very confused about what is happening because they don't like it and they don't want it, but they kind of have some kind of sense that they have to give the adult what they want. So it's a, it's a very deep and difficult area to tackle, but critically, it's one where victims have not felt safe coming forward. And the fact is that lots of responsible adults, be they the police, be they teachers, be they social workers and many others, other family members, community members, have often not believed uh, girls when they've reported abuse. So in the long term, if we're really talking about preventing abuse happening in the first place, we have got to be more open about abuse. We have got to teach children from a young age uh, what their rights are, that only they are entitled to, to their bodies and nobody should be touching it if they don't want them to, that if they go to a trusted adult, they will be believed. We've got to do all that talking and listening. Sarah Green there from the End Violence Against Women Coalition. Now, I wanted to play that to start the discussion. Nishra Mansouri, you've got a background in social work and worked for Bernardo's in Birmingham. Yes. What's your reaction then to the articles in the British media over the last few weeks and what has been highlighted and uncovered by the Times newspaper. I feel um, both sad and disappointed that young people have been let down in this way because um, I can recall working, yes, for Bernardo's over a decade ago um, tackling these kind of issues and the frustrations we felt then as, as practitioners about the voices of young people not being listened to, um, trying to get the attention of the right agencies like the local authority and the police to actually address these issues. And I, and I would like to have thought that um, some 10 years or more later that we would be much more aware, you know, as a society and with um, the structures in place to recognise what we are talking about here when it comes to the sexual exploitation of young people and that we have um, professionals who can work in their individual agencies and, and also work together effectively across the agencies to make sure that, you know, as, as far as possible, some of these young people can, we can prevent some of these crimes from taking place. Um, and, and where there are victims actually attend to their needs and make sure that we've got um, a criminal justice system that is robust. Um, but, you know, sadly, um, what these cases have highlighted are we are still far from that vision today. Professor Jennifer Tamkin, I know you were spurned on to write letters to The Times. What's your reflection then on the coverage from the beginning of the Rochdale cases? Well, I think the media has done a fantastic job, actually. I mean, The Times in particular has investigated all of this and brought it to the attention of the whole country, actually. And um, programmes like this and other programmes are so important um, in focusing on what is going on. But I think w that what is truly appalling is that we should actually need the media to expose all of this um, when... In fact, the law on all of this is absolutely crystal clear. 
you know, it was set out in the Sexual Offences Act 2003, what the law is. That law was drafted deliberately in very lucid terms so that people like social workers would be able to understand it. It wasn't just a, a law drafted for lawyers to understand. And that law sets out quite clearly that sexual intercourse with a girl under 13 is rape. And, you know, if the girl is 13 to 16, there are, if it isn't rape, then there are other um, offences that apply, like sexual activity with a child. Now, the big question here, it seems to me, is what on earth were police officers and social workers doing in not applying the law here? What on earth was going on? This is deeply, deeply scandalous. John, I'd like to come to you now in that you are at the NSPCC, head of the sexual abuse programmes. Can you paint a picture of what's going on now? I understand your charity conducted some freedom of information requests from each police force in the country. What is very clear is that we're dealing with a significant problem, a significant challenge, and I think it's, it's really important to remember also that child sexual exploitation is part of a bigger picture of, chi of child sexual abuse you know, which we've actually been aware of and known about and learned about the sort of dynamics of it now for a number of decades. Um, so it's, it's both sad and concerning that we are still at a situation where we've got the police interviewing um, men with, with very clear allegations of, of uh, sexually abusing girls um, and then uh, releasing them with no charge. And we've got, frankly, social workers as well in some areas, um, you know, uh, if not turning a blind eye to it, then thinking that in some way the girls are complicit or culpable or something like that. That that can never be the case with, with, with child sexual abuse. And uh, children, both girls and boys, get groomed and tricked and conned into thinking sometimes that it's some sort of relationship, um, that they are in some way to, to blame for what's happened, that they are in some way to, to blame for the, the, the abuse actually happening in the first place. That is never the case. Um, and certainly at the NSPCC, we, we provide treatment programs across the country and we hear very frequently the, the kind of confusion and ambivalence that children and young people talk about. I think we, we do need to do, be doing a lot more preventative work. We need to be seeing child sexual exploitation and child sexual abuse as a public health problem and we need to be treating not only the effects of it um, by providing therapeutic work with the, uh, the victims and um, appropriate prison sentences for the offenders and where appropriate treatment for the offenders as well to reduce their risk in the future we not only need to, need to be dealing with those after effects, we need to be engaged in much more primary prevention as well. We do need to be working in schools, we need to be working with children and young people. Child sexual exploitation and child sexual abuse in our communities is unfortunately much more significant than um, most people think. Um, it's, it's a, we're, we're looking at the visible peak of a, of a, a much more significant problem. <laughs> You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spare. We're discussing the recent exposure in the British media that police and social services knew about a child sexual exploitation ring in England a decade ago, but charges were never brought. Joining me is Professor of Law at City University, Jennifer Temkin, a criminal lawyer. John Brown, Head of Sexual Abuse Programmes at Children's Charity, the NSPCC. England Professional Officer at the British Association of Social Workers, Nishra Mansouri. Um, I, I mean, go back to what John said. Um, we, we, we don't know if, um, because these cases have always been around, but in terms of capturing the information and, and having the intelligence and the knowledge about them, so we don't know if they've, um, you know, increased in number, if it's always been the same, because we, we haven't got good enough um, research and information on that. But what I would say is... It is so important that child sexual exploitation is not seen, some, not seen as something that's on the margins of child protection. And reading um, the review, this initial review that's been um, put together on the Rochdale case, and I think the point's made in there that somehow, um, and, and, and this is not to make excuses about you know, the practice that's taken place, but if the resources become narrower and narrower and the focus becomes narrower, so they talk about 
the, you know, the tragedy of baby Peter's death and how um, there was um, much more of a focus from um, local authorities um, looking at younger children and risk to younger children, which of course there should be, but that doesn't mean that we negate responsibility and don't look at children you know, across the piece. And all of the research actually tells us that the children who are most vulnerable are the 0 to 12 month old. And then if you go to the adolescents, if you go to the other end of the um, age range, you know, we should be looking very closely at um, children, young people, if we like to call them young people, but adolescents, male and female, boys and girls, you know, looking at their needs. And, and so often, um, I, I think their needs are neglected and, 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 and there's too much evidence around that tells us that. So this is um, a very so kind of sobering um, messages that are coming from some of these cases and and we have to say, you know, it's not just about producing reports, is it? It's, it's I mean, as my colleague here is saying, um, well, we know what the legislation says. It's, it's, we're not going to argue with the legislation. But if we can't implement it, if we're not using it, then it's not effective. And, and I think we have um, the same issue in terms of policy. So we have some policy direction in this area. But, but I will say, you know, we've got to have people that are trained to have that level of awareness and understanding because we talk about the complexity of child abuse. Child abuse is very complex and this is a strand of child abuse here, child sexual exploitation. And we must make sure that all professionals of all persuasions have that basic understanding and knowledge to start with and then building on that for people who are more, you know, do, doing more of the specialist work so they have the right training and support to be able to um, support young people in these situations. John said that sexual abuse exploitation of children must be seen as a public health problem how how is society going to do that john well i, th I think um it, it's about engaging in in a evidence-based and kind of rational discussion really about 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 the the, the, the problem of, of, of child sexual abuse about the fact that it does go on in all communities not getting you know kind of hysterical about it it does get it does go on in all communities um, but it can be prevented. And, you know, from our research and from research in the U.S., there are, there are three key things that, that we, 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 you know, we, we're pretty clear about now that are, need to be in place to really make an impact in, in reducing the incidence of child sexual abuse and child sexual exploitation. And they are deterrents for a start. You know, if offenders think they're going to get caught, that, that they're... Um, many of them will, will not will not do it, and you know the, these men who have been sexually exploiting and abusing girls have been carrying on with it because uh, they've been getting away with it because they've been um, brought into the police station, interviewed, and then released without charge um, because they've been pretty visibly targeting and grooming uh, uh, children and, and, and girls on on, on streets and, um, uh, and and picking them up and getting and getting away with it. So deterrence is absolutely key. Appropriate and you know proportionate but appropriate prison sentences that give a really strong message that this will not be tolerated in any of our communities. Secondly, treatment, as I said, you know, treatment for the victims is absolutely key, I think, really, because we know that the impacts of child sexual abuse can really get really damagingly, damagingly transmitted into intergenerationally from generation to generation. And by that, I don't mean that victims go on to become abusers, a small proportion do, but not many, but the, the mental health issues and the, the, the psychological damage can get transmitted from generation to generation, so treatment is key. It's also important where appropriate to treat the, the abusers as well to reduce their risk. And then finally, prevention is, 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 is the, the third strand, I think, really, um, in, in, in a public health approach to, to sexual abuse prevention, education and awareness raising with, with children and young people in schools, with families and with, with communities as well. And and, you know, there is some, we are learning from this, and I think we, we ought to remember that, that the, the, the current government, you know, has taken some good steps in relation to child sexual exploitation. The previous Minister for Children, Tim Lawton, has, has done some good work, I think, really, prior to his, uh, um, his, his, his the, the ministerial changes, um, has, done, has, has done, led some good work, I think, in relation to encouraging um, and, and um, expecting local authorities to put uh, child sexual exploitation action plans and prevention plans in place. And areas like Derby, you know, that have had their own challenges and problems with child sexual exploitation have taken some really good steps, I think, in uh, really a good multi-agency coordination, sharing of information, which is absolutely key, and ensuring that all professionals and all agencies in the local area know about, you know, kind of where, where the risks are, where the, the high-risk communities are, and what steps can be taken to... to um, 
really in, impact on that and, and, and take some steps to disrupt activity. So there is some good, good action and, and good, good um, steps that are being taken with, with some areas and with some local authorities. But at the NSPCC, I think we would say that that needs to be extended. Those child sexual exploitation action plans need to be extended to include child sexual abuse action and prevention plans because this is part of a much, a much bigger problem. Professor Jennifer Temkin then, um, you mentioned in, in your letter to the Times about the legal system in Scandinavia. If we are to move on from this, what needs to be done other than obviously what J John's mentioned in terms of it becoming a public health problem and the initiative surrounding that, what can we do to prevent this? Well, I think first of all that people have to be held to account. A lot of people have not been doing what they should have been doing. A lot of um, police officers, social workers have not done what they should have done. And I feel that these people should be held responsible. They, there should be disciplinary proceedings. Um, I think there should be legal actions. Um, obviously, the victims are entitled to compensation, but we should also be talking in terms of civil actions, um, quite possibly civil actions for against local authorities and police forces for their gross negligence in failing to carry out their duty in a situation which, frankly, was blindingly obvious. You know, it, it's not rocket science, this, actually, where you have children who are being raped and sexually abused. It's quite clear that people in authority have failed to do their duty. So, and unless you actually do take these steps against these people, I'm afraid we're going to be here in five years' time, we're going to be in exactly the same place. Um, and then I think that in addition to this, there are steps that can be taken actually to help those children who have the courage, and let's face it, is it is extreme courage, actually, to come forward and to tell the police, look, this is what's happening to me. I don't like it. I want it to stop. Um, likewise, children who are going to see social workers. I do think there is a room for the Scandinavian system in which a child who reports to the police automatically is given a legal representative who can carry forward their case, make sure that they are dealt with fairly and that this matter is not simply brushed under the carpet for whatever reason, whether it's because the perpetrators come from uh, a Pakistani background, whatever it is, we need to make sure that um, those people who are responsible are held to account. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spare, where we're discussing the exploitation of children when it comes to sexual abuse. Joining me is Professor of Law at City University, Jennifer Temkin, John Brown, Head of Sexual Abuse Programmes at Children's Charity, the NSPCC, and England Professional Officer at the British Association of Social Workers, Nushra Mansouri. Nushra, how did it come to this? I mean, the enormous failings on an enormous scale. It's embarrassing, I think, for Britain. I think it's um, shaming for us, isn't it, as, as a country, um, to have these really um, extreme cases where, you know, we, we read the reports, we read the findings, we read the coverage in the media, um, and it's it's just shocking, isn't it? It's horrifying um, to read those the stories of, of what these young people have been through. But I think in, in all kinds of cases of, of child abuse, we, we're going to have that kind of emotional impact. But that's why these things need to be in the public domain. Um, so that, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd balance it with, we never ever hear about, you know, the good news stories. I have to always say that. Um, so it's it's so it could then um, colour your whole view of all the um, organisations and professionals that are involved that they never do a good job and that that isn't the whole story either because thankfully you know we have examples of good practice I think with child sexual exploitation not enough I will say that and I and I think it needs to be spread 
you know, across the country on a consistent basis. It cannot be a postcode lottery of where you are that you get a better service because there are services in place. I mean, they should be consistently available to any young person in the country. Um, but it, it is right that we have the information available and it's there in the public domain, as shocking and as upsetting as that is, so that we can, you know, all of us um, try and absorb some of this and then say, OK, where do we go from here? So when this all dies down and the media aren't covering it as much, how much heightened sort of alert are people on the front line, police officers, social workers, teachers, going to be? as a result of, of these exposures? I think they will be because there's always an, um, like a knock-on effect when you have you know, such shocking cases. And um, maybe, maybe the organisation that we haven't spoken about today is in every um, local authority across the country, they have um, a local children's safeguarding board. So they bring together all the agencies. So you've mentioned education, you've men mentioned social services, you've mentioned the police, and John's talked very you know, importantly about health as well. So all those agencies are brought round the table. And it's through, I think, um, the boards themselves that these messages then have to be transmitted to um, those agencies about, well, the, the, the training, the procedures, how are we going to work together, what is our strategy, do we have a subgroup in place? Um, some research was done by, I think it was the University of Bedfordshire, um, following um, some of the guidance that had been issued by the government just to see what progress was being made. And, and that's about being held to account again. So we, we need to see that, OK, have they got a plan? How are they actually... Um, you know, orchestrating that? How, how are they carrying that out? How are the various agencies working together? So it is about scrutiny, isn't it? It is about asking those questions, but that, that is the role, to some extent, of the local children's safeguarding boards. Jennifer, you say the legal system is in place. I think there's a real danger here that once the media back away from this, and this, of course, is inevitable because, um, you know, there's another story coming up which has nothing to do with this. Um, I, I'm very much afraid that um, unless we do something very clear now, um, this is going to keep coming up as an issue. And so I've mentioned the various legal actions that can be taken. I think we have to be a bit sceptical about training. You know, it's always said, um, you know, we need to train, etc. But I think we have to scrutinise the training. What is this training? How effective is it? Um, I think that's a very important thing to do as well. No, sure. I just want to read out a, a very short letter that was in the Times alongside alongside yours, Jennifer. They said, Sir, if a social worker is incapable of differentiating between a prostitute and a sexually abused child, they are clearly in the wrong job. It is recruitment policies, not training programmes that require revision. So training, but it must come from the beginning, it must come at the heart, at, yes. at, at the level of recruitment. I'm not going to disagree with that. Um, our attitudes are so important as professionals, you know, whether we're social workers, police officers, teachers, our attitudes inform our thinking and our judgments. And um, when we're working with children, it is about listening to these children. It's about hearing. Because as a social worker, I've been a social worker for a long time. And when I listen to children and young people that I've worked with, they can tell me things that, you know, might be um, beyond um, my own experiences. But that's irrelevant. They're telling me things that really have happened to them. So we cannot have a culture of disbelief. So in terms of the training, it, it can't be some, some kind of superficial exercise. But it's got to be challenging. For me, you know, training is something that helps us to develop as individuals and, and sometimes has to change our thinking if our thinking is not correct. So it's got to be, I know this word is overused, but in a way, the training itself has to be fairly robust so that people come out of that room and, you know, they've, they've gone into the room with maybe um, feeling one way and they come out feeling very challenged and, you know, maybe determined, more determined um, to deal with these issues and, and more confident, obviously, um, to deal with these issues. John, then, training is essential, wouldn't you? Because of obviously the uh, statistics you found from your FOI request in all the police forces, is it that one in six children are abused? 
Yes, and and tra- training training is is is, is certainly part part of uh, a, a crucial part of of um, the uh, any any prevention plan for for child sexual abuse, un- un- undoubtedly. I think um, and that training also needs to have a very clear focus on uh, ensuring that professionals understand the dynamics of sexual abuse. Um, sexual abuse thrives um, where denial is in place and where there's lack of understanding in place. And that is how perpetrators are able to groom not only the child, uh, not only the, those immediate adults surrounding the child, but their environment as well. And, I, you know, I think I do think in some of these recent cases that that's what's happened. Um, uh, professionals, you know, police um, and, and, and other agencies as well have been seduced into thinking that in some, and it sounds bizarre to say it, but in some way these girls were... Um, complicit these girls were agreeing with what was going on um, and were in some way able to give their informed consent to being sexually abused by by, by these men Um, and you know through their inaction um, professionals have enabled that to continue to and and have have supported an environment whereby child sexual exploitation exploitation and sexual abuse can continue so i think understanding the dynamics of of of, of sexual abuse and how it occurs is absolutely critical and that could give some really important pointers to how to disrupt it and how to prevent it and i also think and whilst this isn't very popular with the current government we do need a strong government lead on this you know action plans are great and encouraging and cajoling local authorities to put them in place goes somewhere but in terms of really making a change i think i think we need a, a stronger government focus on uh, this issue of child sexual abuse and, and, and particularly child sexual exploitation well i think it's actually quite simple we pay policemen and policewomen to do a job just do it and the same is true for social workers just do what you're being paid to do and then perhaps we'll make some progress nishra over the last two years and and even beyond that many of our public services have been under great pressure and that has had an an impact on um, the reach I think when we're looking at issues of child protection and when we're we're looking at issues where children are at risk um, if we think about some of the recent issues that have come to the fore that are less well known by the public which would include child sexual exploitation, which would include issues of forced marriage, which would include issues of child trafficking. And those are the issues that I worry will go to the periphery or even are at the periphery, but they become more marginalised because um, the focus of um, child protection because it's so, so governed by um, resources and they have to be finite, but we can then lose sight of so many other children and young people. And for me, that is what has to change. I'd like to thank all my guests, Professor of Law at City University, Jennifer Temkin, Nushra Mansouri, the England Professional Officer at the British Association of Social Workers, and John Brown, Head of Sexual Abuse Programmes at Children's Charity, the NSPCC.